You're listening to the MSG Podcast. That's movies with Sarah and Garrison. And we're here to talk about Isle of Dogs. This is our, sort of our late review of it. Because we were supposed to watch this like like a week and a half, two weeks ago. As soon as it came out. Yeah, but um, like the closest place was like like, like two hours away or something. But it's showing locally here at the Neon, which is a like two theater theater. Yeah, it's like a independent kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they play a a lot of uh, indie films here and and um yet it's really interesting pretty cool place now this was your first time going there what was your uh your impression they serve out and it's really cute you didn't get any though no i wasn't looking to get alcohol but they had good popcorn all right so yeah if you're in the uh, dayton area and um you're not alcoholic uh (laughs) movie lover then go go to the neon um yeah i mean there's plenty of seats in there too i felt like i was uh, i mean i walked in thinking maybe that it was gonna be kind of just like a small group but there was quite a few people there and yeah and after we left there were, uh, it was a line outside of the door almost. waiting yeah. to go see the movie mm-hmm. so i mean today's a good day to see it too kind of rainy outside right now right but i mean it was a really good experience i felt like garrison sat in the back i went and sat up in the front because i wanted to get a good picture of it uh, well i didn't want to like break my neck looking at, at the screen but they reclined they had nice seats i was like leaning back real far i didn't want to turn my head you know uh drastically just to look at the whole picture that's fair did you have to do that i did not but i did drop my keys a little for the movie and that was not fun anyway um so yeah isle of dogs way better than fantastic mr fox and i have my reasons and i'll name them in a minute okay so you're you're saying it was better now i'm not gonna make that assertion just yet because you know we saw it less than than a half an hour ago so it's still kind of fresh so i so so i want to wait until it settles before i uh I say my piece on that matter. Okay. But yeah, first impressions of it was um, the the animation was great. Like this film pretty much s- solidifies uh, stop motion as like a viable art uh, source. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's fantastic, and and the an- animation for Isle of Dogs was a bit different than Fantastic Mr. Fox, I think. Oh yeah, it definitely was. I think they really pulled out all of their resource for the um, not that they did for Fantastic. Mr. Mr. Fox, but I feel like that one was more of an experiment for him, more or less. He's sort of testing the right. waters a bit. Right, to see what kind of he felt worked best. And maybe that's one reason why I was interested in it, but it was... It was like he was trying to make a live action animation with Fantastic Mr. Fox. I didn't get that feeling with the Isle of Dogs, though. Right. Uh, yeah, for Mr. Fo- Fantastic Mr. Fox, it was... So the source material was from a book, was from a storybook, and that book had a lot, had a lot of whimsy and, and, uh, and, and f- fantastical aspects to it. So I think he wanted to capture that within the animation. But I think for this... It was like it felt grander in scope and the, the stakes felt higher. Yeah, it definitely did. Yeah. And the and it was also a bit lighter on the humor than I think Fantastic Mr. Fox as well. Yeah, there was a lot of um I would say more adult humor in that one. Fantastic Mr. Fox there was Isle of Dogs. There's a lot of cute little quirkiness that a lot of the characters have. And it maybe it's a lot to do with who's playing it. You know, like Bill Murray's in there, Brian Cranston's in there. They're amazing actors that bring bring their own quirks to to film so you know Wes Anderson really does like to film he needed him in there yeah he he likes working with a lot of the same people because um Edward Norton has been in in a couple of his things Mm. and yeah yeah he likes to use a lot of the same people so they probably like working too Mm -hmm. Uh, right yeah this was like very cinematic like it had a a really like big feel to it right and 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 it's amazing how they were able to capture that you know you know thinking back to it was like fantastic Fantastic Mr. Fox, I think, showed in, like, big motion theaters right off the bat, where this one, I mean, it took a while for it to get to us. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, are you sure about that? Because... Uh, maybe. That's just from my memory. Because, like, this is playing at, you know, places near me, so maybe it just took a while before it, it, uh, re... It was a wider release, so. Oh, so cool fact here. Um, I'm gonna get to facts, okay, but... Fine. Okay, I was going to talk about the budget, the difference in budget. 
Okay, I don't have that. Go. All right. So, cool fact: the budget for this one. I imagine it's much less, right? It for is. It is Crocs. much less. Oh wait, no. Sorry, I'm looking at the box off. Uh, pull that up. Should... It's the growth. Did you type in budget? Mm-hmm. Maybe they haven't released the budget for it yet. Right. Yeah. So, what's Fantastic Mr. Fox then? So, the budget for Fantastic Mr. Fox was forty million. I imagine this like one was 67. way less. I say like sixty-seven. You think it's higher? All right. Well, wait. I guess... So you think this one is? You think I Love Dogs is less? I do. But this. Um, box office was way low, super low, but they only opened a couple theaters. How many theaters does it say? This opening weekend, it grew 600. Well, could that, well, Isle, Isle of Dogs, you know, that, it technically had an opening weekend like a couple weeks ago. Right. So, I, I'm not sure if they ha had the same thing as this movie did but yeah i was thinking like i was looking at it and it was saying like 17 mil for the the gross but i thought it was the budget so never mind forget what i was saying moving on right yeah so this this film had like great like maybe it was just the theater that we were in but the sound was like really like chris was like really it was nice yeah it's like i was with there like on the island mm -hmm. with them and the music was, was put you there so really great like music choices it did um yeah yeah, I mean, it was just like a really inspiring little film, I think. And there was action in every scene. Like, I don't think that there was a scene that went slow for me. Yeah, it moved along. It uh, it didn't overstay its welcome. Mm -mm. It was very paced, paced very well. Right. Um... And this this really wasn't only a stop motion uh, animated movie because during the like the drones and the news it was sort mm -hmm. of like like cardboard uh, 2D classical yes animation yeah so they really I mean they did a lot of mixed media with it mm -hmm. um, yeah I don't know like I don't want to spoil too much because I really just recommend going to see it yourself it yeah I mean it was great but as far as like the story goes um, there's a dog island where the mayor of Magasaki banished dog because he was quote unquote dishonorable and he decides to do that everyone's mad at him he has like sort of like a nephew-ish kid named Atari that decides to go and find his dog on dog Island. yeah and and pretty much from there that's where the story take takes off mm -hmm. um Atari meets some dogs there and they go hunting for uh for Atari's lost dog uh, mm -hmm. spot mm -hmm. so main characters that you're probably going to recognize brian cranston as chief um rex as ed norton king bob of babylon boss played by bill murray and then duke played by jeff goldblum so the five dogs are fantastic they all have like their own personality they just play along really well mm -hmm. yeah especially i think the ones that had the most to do were um chief uh, rex and uh bill murray mm -hmm. i think they had the most dialogue and yeah yeah so a little side note about the dialogue the only people that speak english are the interpreters and the dogs but none of them can really understand each other well sort of and like a weird way they can sort of understand each other i think that was actually a really clever choice because mm -hmm. at first i was wondering hey why aren't there subtitles why don't we get it right but we are the dog like the viewer are, are, are the dogs and right. we're not really meant to understand completely what the human is saying right but there's like a narrator and then there's interpreters and then there is the dogs that really just tell the story um atari played by Kaiyu ranken is like a kid that only speaks japanese <laughs> so you can't understand him but like you can kind of get a feel for what he's saying simply just by context and what's going on and some of the words like like, you'll understand because they'll say biscuit or something like that. Or they'll say doga. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, so you'll pick up on, on like, like small words, uh, further enforcing, like, the, like, the viewer is meant to be the dog. Mm-hmm. Like, sit. Sit-do. Yeah. sit -do. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a very precious little movie. I'm, I'm so glad that they chose people to actually speak Japanese in this film. Like, I wonder if you were a Japanese viewer. Oh, yeah, you would, yeah, I think the, oh, I wonder. Oh, no. Okay, well, here's a thought that I just thought of. So, mm -hmm. for the Japanese viewers, the characters that are speaking Japanese, what if they, like, change it to English to or, English or, or Spanish. Spanish or something like that? Yeah, because they would get the whole movie instantly, and I think keeping the viewer in the 
dark you know help to tell the story yeah. that's a good point i kind of wonder now um i'm not sure what countries this aired in but it would be cool to know but they did i think ear it air it in um spanish-speaking countries because they have um an isle de Perro. Hmm, interesting yes um the oh right the the narrator i don't i, I don't think we talked about him yet so I really like the narrator's voice. Like, yeah, it was a very smooth, comforting voice. And at first, um, b- before you told me that that was um, uh, Courtney, B. Courtney, Courtney B. B. Vance, it sounded like um, like Keith David. Do you know who that is? I don't know. Uh, have you ever seen the cartoon Gargoyles? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that guy. The like the late the gargoyle. Goliath. Yeah. Um, and he's yeah he's done a bunch of other cartoons and stuff but it also kind of sounded like the the all the all state guy yes you know, <laughs> yes i could see that one probably more more so yeah but i would never have guessed it was courtney b vance to be honest with you so i mean thinking thinking about the story a little bit more it's it's kind of goes back to the trope of like cats versus dogs like the ancient history of cat people versus dog people mm-hmm. so i wonder like if they make if they'll make like a cat movie or something like that. isle of cats isle of cats Hmm. What, so like a sequel or... Mm, just... Yeah, something like that. But like they didn't give the cats any character. Mm. They only gave the dogs character. So I wonder if Wes Anderson is a dog person. Uh, that's actually in my facts, I believe. So. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, all right. So the the uh, Japanese name, they were like Atari, mm-hmm. s- um, Su- Suzuki, and Kobayashi. Um, Very generic names. Yeah, like have you heard of a uh, Kobayashi Maru? I feel like I have like I know it's like a yeah it's like a a, a thing uh, can you can you look that up real fast Kobayashi Maru yeah it's like a thing from like Star Trek or something I think Kobayashi Maru is a training exercise in the fictional Star Trek universe designed and test designed to test the character of Starfleet Academy cadets in a no win scenario it's interesting I wonder if that because since the mayor and the kid like really important characters in the story um, the mayor sort of, uh, had this plot, right? And they were really stuck in a, in a, in a really hostile situation. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because, like, they kind of depict the mayor as, like, a villain in the story, but it turns out he's... Hey, is that spoilers? Yeah. yeah, you know, I don't, yeah just, just don't mention it. Okay. <laughs> Turns out. turns out he <laughs> turns out he's not as he first seems yes but um uh final note for me um did this make you uh think about your dog all mm. the time <laughs> i was like in tears almost because i was like oh i wonder what lando thinks of me but then i'm like his mom so he probably doesn't think this thing i'm not like a 12 year old boy and a dog so i'm an adult with a dog a baby dog well, um, were there any like negatives that you thought? I thought the baby puppies were weird looking, but they're <laughs> they're always weird looking. Baby puppies, fresh puppies are always weird looking. My one negative, at least for now, since you know we saw it like forty minutes ago. But the one thing that sort of sticks out is like the faces were slightly uh, going towards going towards Uncanny Valley. A like little bit. with what do you mean? Like their their faces look kind of like a bit too humanish, a bit, but not as much as uh, Anna Melissa. I can see what you're saying, but uh, there were some characters I think that were more I guess animated than other ones. But mm. like I can see what you're saying. They the eyes, the way they depict the eyes are fantastic. They really did a great job giving um these characters animated eyes uh like their pupils would go large their the eye movements were amazing i i did not not see a single flaw in the animation wise the voice acting was really good yeah i think this like something would be lost in in translation if this were animated with like um uh, computers or with CGI. Um, yeah or with um, you know like 2d animation or something right because they were glassy you know like the eyes were glassy the fur was furry right hair like yeah the fur was furry the eyes were glassy and there were like subtle movements in their bodies that conveyed certain emotions um yeah uh definitely go see this if you're a fan of animation if you like dog if, if you uh, have a dog if you have a dog if you like wes anderson if another thing too i think comparison wise from fantastic mr fox to isle of dog the color scheme is much better for this one mm-hmm. for isle of dogs um 
when I was watching Fantastic Mr. Fox, it's all from the same same color palette. So it's hard for me to like capture all of the details with, with that. But this one, there's a lot more contrast. So it's much more eye capturing. Right. Right. For Fantastic Mr. Fox, I mentioned this in that podcast, but um, yeah, it had lots of autumn colors, like capture that sort of fall feel. And what most like animated movies do is they'll like make a, a color a script. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that this film definitely definitely utilize that to like capture different feels with the colors throughout the film oh yeah, yeah. it definitely did um is that all for you on the review well i mean i was gonna mention that wes anderson really i think gave tribute to old japanese classic films in the the music the loud drums that they would use the kind of he yeah he added a lot of cultural aspects to this one um for the and maybe i'm just like a fangirl of japanese culture but they he really gave tribute to culture right and uh on yes so i've been hearing a lot of like positive things on social media about this film Mm -hmm. and you know the turnout for this film that when we got when we saw it was pretty nice and there were some people coming in and this is starting to play in more theaters and uh and i think it'll do really well and this should let hollywood know that it's okay to to like hire uh different races of people because you know half of to play yeah, the race that they're meant to play well not even that because i think that that shouldn't matter like it should be be the voice but mm. the fact that you know half of, of the this uh, film was in japanese yeah and they hired a lot of japanese actors yoko ono famous yeah. character that japanese yes yeah, so, yeah so so these things shouldn't discourage ho- hollywood from uh trying different things mm-hmm. experimenting more because i think that you know people want to see these things and and uh they you know hollywood shouldn't stagnate in in their creativity and um the people that they they hire on for these projects yeah definitely anyway back right, right for the facts. wait are we doing a quiz today too well i was gonna gonna like write some questions down when i was in the theater but one it was too dark and and two uh i was so enthralled mm-hmm. that i kind of forgot about I it. Think that's a good good sign all right that means i don't have to do right. anything weird today all right facts Okay, so fact number one: this film was influenced by you know the Rankin and Bass, um, like Christmas. Oh, yeah, like so, like the Rudolph stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's those, cool. Yeah. Hmm. Um, this film was written and directed by Wes Anderson. Did you know that? I did. Did know that? I did know. That. Well, and yes. right, so this is was Wes Anderson's eighth collaboration with Bill Murray. Huh. Yeah, it's eighth film. I wonder if they drink together. They have to. I mean, it's been like twelve plus years since they've been working together. Right. Um. And right, so this was the longest stop motion film, uh, beating Coraline by two minutes. Holy shit! Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah. All right. So hold on. I have the time. I think it was like an hour and forty one minutes. Mm. Yeah, it was like an hour and forty one minutes. And there is an island in the east, in the east, in the east end of London. <laughs> <laughs> called isle of dog huh yeah in, uh, in okay and yeah so in previous films wes anderson uh built a bit of a uh, reputation for how he he handled dogs in movies and a lot of dogs ended up in like dead or hurt um yeah in three of his movies uh dogs died yeah like uh, actual dog no like in the movie a dog died i have to think back i don't know yeah well, one one is fantastic mr fox they had like they had some poisoned blueberries oh, a dog right. died and Wes Anderson allowed uh, the opportunity for one fan to visit a set and voice um, one of the dogs. So um, I bet you it was. I think I know which dog it was. Really? Yes. Which one? It was probably the dog that was like mm-hmm. talking to um, Atari's uh, Spots. It was well, Spots was in the cage, and I don't know if you know, remember the dog. But he had like a circle around his eye, and then like his other eye was like black around the other one, mm-hmm. and he was like talking to him. It's like, yeah, there's cannibal dogs in hmm. i'm pretty sure that that had to have been him small part that's a pretty big part really i think pretty big it's a good part final fact can you say isle of dogs for me isle of dog yes you do you do love dogs i do love dogs yeah. oh <laughs> that's the final fact yeah I- isle of dogs sounds like uh i love dogs that's yeah. blessed yeah <laughs> <laughs> um final thought the fun i swear i had another one um 
Okay, now I don't, no, I don't remember. I don't remember now. Oh, yeah, so cultural-wise, I think it also played on a lot of the issues that Japan's faced. What's that? Politically-wise. Um, well, their leader is pretty, pretty strict about a lot of the things he does. Um, they have a lot of geographic issues, like volcanoes, earthquakes. They're basically in the ring of fire. So all of the stuff that, like, happened in the movie happens, like, on the daily over in Japan. Because, yeah, yet there was that scene in the movie where they're talking about tsunamis and volcanoes and stuff and it happens <laughs> yeah yeah just like well, like six seven years ago there was that uh like that 10 that, earthquake yeah like an earthquake and the the nuclear plant like messed up yeah man uh, you really had to end this on a, on a sour note didn't you it's not sour that just happens the truth it played on a lot of very political issues you have over there mm. yeah it's kind of weird to think that the japanese may not be around when we're old you know unless they move yeah because i told you um maybe this was in a previous podcast but i think it's like more than half other pop population within the next 50 years will be over 70 so that's another problem there oh they're not having kids yeah so. anyways uh go support the japanese may maybe that'll make them feel be- feel better <laughs> How do you support the Japanese cares? Watch more anime. Yes. <laughs> and and uh and and catch us later for our uh talk on um My Hero Academia episodes four, five, and six. Maybe that'll cheer you up. Yes, do that. <laughs> Listen to that one. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.